For all my complaining about Space Marines that I have done before and are probably going to still do in this video, they're cool. As I've said before, they're the face of Warhammer for a good reason. And I'm self-aware enough to admit that at least a small bit of the reason myself and others constantly complain about them is a little bit of jealousy. The Astartes get an entire novel series about all their origin stories, the Eldar get some garbage trilogy that gets canned early because it was so garbage. I hope you can at least see how us Xeno fans would be a little bit upset with that. But speaking of Xenos, what about the faction that simply doesn't care about all of that lore? Not because they regard humanity as completely beneath them, such as the Eldar and the Necrons. I mean they don't care because they are physically incapable of comprehending your space marine fatherless behavior. Motivations and ideological struggles are nothing to this faction. Because to them, all of these countless armies and the reasons to fight are nothing more than lunch. It's Tyranid time, folks. Strap in and get ready to feast because it's time for the nids to show you what an all-you-can-eat buffet really looks like. And since this video is technically educational, I mean I am teaching you about how to play an army in Warhammer, I should tell you about quite the fantastic source of learning when it comes to math and computer science. It's not a dreary high school classroom or an expensive college course. It's brilliant, the educational website and app to make sure you're up to snuff on math, computer, and data science and everything those subjects entail, which is quite a bit, I can assure you. They're also the sponsor of today's video, so why don't I tell you about it? Brilliant is the best way to learn all about these fields, because it isn't just slogging through coursework for a little other reason than you need to graduate. You know what a science teacher told me once? That after I reach high school, learning stops being anything remotely fun and turns miserable. Well, Brilliant says to hell with that. Nothing has to be miserable. Its courses are actually quite engaging and, dare I say, fun. There's thousands of them to choose from and learn from, and more are added every month, so you're never short on options. Lately, I've been checking out the Thinking and Code course. A friend of mine is learning to code, and several more are computer engineers proper, so I figured it'd be a good course both to help me learn a useful skill, and so I can actually try and follow along with them when they talk about their jobs. To no surprise, the course is easy to use and actually helped me understand the basics of how code works. It starts off using the analogy of getting a car from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible, which might sound silly, but please trust me when I say it's actually really helpful for visualizing how coding works. Of course, this doesn't mean Brilliant is only for people like me who aren't entirely sure coding isn't in the same language as the Necronomicon, there's plenty for advanced lessons for those of you who have proper knowledge of the subjects. And they're done entirely at your own pace. I did the first lesson in thinking and code at 3 in the morning. Brilliant doesn't judge, it's happy to let me learn no matter what hour of the night it is. While I'm sure you probably aren't in the same sleep schedule as me, or at least I dearly hope so, the same principle holds just as true. Log on to Brilliant for as long or as little as you want to. If you want to brush up for upcoming exams or sit down for 3 hours and power through as many lessons as you can, Brilliant will account you either way. And just to sweeten the deal, something special for you. Using my link in the description and pinned comment, the first 200 of you to sign up will get 20% off your annual plan. And just so there isn't any confusion on the matter, the link is also on screen. That's brilliant.org slash pancreas no work slash for 20% off your annual plan. And just to put the cherry on top, you can try the first 30 days of Brilliant for free, even if you aren't one of the first 200 on the link. It's never too late to start learning, and you can trust that I mean that because I'm an education major. So get Brilliant today and ensure that when it comes to math and science, you'll always be at your best. Now then, get ready to feast. A big thank you to Mandalore Gaming for introducing me to yet another strategy game to rip music from for these videos. Couldn't think of a better video to start using it on than this one. The Tyranids are the plague of locusts God sent to Egypt if it was intergalactic in scale and full of hate. Unlike most other factions in 40k, they have no direct ties to anyone within the setting. For the most part, you can separate the majority of the factions into two distinct origin stories, the War in Heaven or the Horus Heresy. The Horus Heresy for the Imperium and Human Followers of Chaos, and and the War in Heaven for the Necrons, Orcs, Eldar, and arguably Chaos itself. Obviously, there's a whole lot more than just that going into these factions, but those two conflicts are the driving forces behind much of the setting. The Tyranids, however, are one of the only factions who break this mold, alongside the Leagues of Otan and Tau. Even then, however, those two factions have still been shaped by circumstances in the galaxy. The Tyranids, meanwhile, don't have a stake in anything going on in the galaxy beyond how it affects them eating everyone inside of it. That's not to say they're blind to the goings-on of the Milky Way or fail to notice what was happening inside of it. In a move that I'm still not sure how to feel about, the Horus Heresy provided the initial alert to the Tyranids that the Milky Way had plenty of food inside of it. On the planet of Sotha during the Heresy, Loyalists and Traitor Forces fought for a device called the Pharos, essentially a mini-astronomicon built by the Necrons. Not as good as the real deal, but still better than nothing. Barabas Dantioch, a Loyalist Iron Warrior and man whose name I keep pronouncing is Barbarous on accident, sacrificed himself and overloaded it so that the traitors couldn't use it. Now, to avoid getting too technical with things, this made a very big kaboom. 
In the Immaterium, it made an extremely big kaboom. And though no one would realize it for another 10,000 years, this had some pretty dire consequences. The Tyranid hive mind took notice and converged on the Milky Way galaxy. It didn't take note of any conflict that might have caused such a thing, or any of the science slash magic that goes into it. All it did was take the information in, analyze if it meant there was food to be found, and decided it meant there was. Way to go, Dantioc. I guess no good deed goes unpunished after all. I'm unsure how I feel about this, because on the one hand, it's managing to somehow tie the actions of yet another faction into the Horus fucking heresy. On the other hand, it's Space Marines doing the galaxy, which is extremely pleasing to me. Hell, the book Pharos, where the excerpt about this is from, even mentions the hive mind shifting course, which means if it wasn't for Dantioc, the hive mind would have been another galaxy's problem. Nice job saving the day, Mr. Dantioc. I'm sure everyone who's had to face down a hive tyrant is thankful for your sacrifice. After that, there was, as I said, a 10,000 year gap between the Pharaohs ringing the dinner bell and the Tyranids arriving. Prior to the First Tyrannic War, in the year 500 M41, an Imperial merchant fleet encountered weird Xenos with tentacle faces. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, these were gene stealers who were likely assisting the hive mind in making a proper entrance to the galaxy, though they may have been there for as long as 5,000 years. The Salamanders purged them as the Imperium realized they were rather dangerous, but the true threat wasn't to become apparent for another 250 years. And then, year 745 M41. Hive Fleet Bayamoth makes landfall in the galaxy. The planet Tyran is the first to fall, and the threat is named the Tyranids after the fact. Dozens of planets fell to its advance, while the Inquisitor Kripman tried his damnedest to figure out the true scope of the disaster and track where its next move would be. His efforts were in no small way hindered by the nature of the Tyranid threat. Not only did they leave no survivors, as survivors were biomass and therefore food, but they caused the Shadow and the Warp, a near-total shutdown of the ability for Imperial Astromancers to communicate. It does more than that, it also makes warp travel damn near impossible and can even prevent Psyker powers from being used, but for Kripman's purposes, the communications blackout it caused was the worst effect. After analyzing the data, he realized there was no grand strategic plan to be had. The only thing the Tyranids were following were planets rich in biomass. And their next target was where else but Makrog, the home of the Ultramarines. Kripman managed to make it their head of High Fleet Bayamoth, and the Ultramarines were forewarned of the threat. Even with this, the Battle of Makrog tore into the Smurfs like nothing else before it. The entire First Company was destroyed, and the rest of the chapter wasn't exactly in a great state either. Although only one major world was lost, dozens of minor worlds were eliminated as well, and the Ultramarines were forced to acknowledge that a book written 10,000 years ago wasn't enough to face every single threat the galaxy might throw at them. Which makes Leandro's blind devotion to the Codex all the more confusing, since Marnius Calgar himself was the one to tell all the Ultramarines that you can't read the book for all the answers. Leandros being the worst aside, I mean we all know that already, the Imperium managed to figure out some of the weaknesses of the Tyranids. Specifically, their bioships and synapse creatures. If they go down, the Tyranids lose any sort of coordination until a similar creature can arrive or be formed. With this, the Imperium armed itself with knowledge of the coming threat. The Ultramarines naturally repaired the losses they took at what would be record speed for anyone else, on account of the Genesis chapter existing for no other reason than to let the Ultramarines pretend their codex compliant, and if any more Tyranids were looking out there, the Imperium would be ready. Then two more major Tyrannic Wars happened, with High Fleet's Kraken and Leviathan, both of which nearly took not only entire sectors of the Imperium itself out, but Craft or Lyandon as well. Each of these threats took down thousands of worlds and made them almost completely unusable after the fact, since the Tyranids stripped the planet down to the bone. It's not just living beings they eat, they consume much of the metal and other resources on a planet as well. And even beyond that, plenty of stuff beyond combatants are living things. You think a planet is going to have an atmosphere after every single oxygen producing life form on it is getting digested? Imagine what would happen in the atmosphere on Earth if someone ate the Amazon rainforest over the course of a month. And coming into 10th edition of Warhammer, it would seem that the bulk of the Tyranids are finally reaching the galaxy, or at the very least, the bulk of High Fleet Leviathan. Of note is that the previous Great Tyrannic Wars against High Fleet's Bayamoth and Kraken shattered the fleets and forced them to split into splinter fleets, but it would seem Leviathan's initial encounter during the Third Tyrannic War was just a taste of what was to come. Only time will truly tell if this is the bulk of the Tyranid invasion or if there is still yet more to come. If you want my opinion, the latter's true. But that's just speculation. What are the pros and cons of these voracious monsters? Starting us off with their lore positives, if you couldn't give less of a shit about any sort of narrative taking place in the Fordicky universe and just want to kill, then the Tyranids are the best option for you. Everyone else has some sort of narrative, even if it's a small one. Reclaim a long-lost empire, cause havoc in the name of your dark god, conquer the galaxy for the glory of the Emperor. Even the Yorks have some grand motivations, not many since most of them are happy to just fight, but Gazine's great Waz is at the very least slightly more ambitious than the average Greenskin. 
Tyranids, quite simply, do not care in the slightest about any of it. They are here for food. Your ideological struggle simply cannot be comprehended by the hive mind. And to save time, I won't repeat the obvious downside of this in the cons section. Yes, that does mean that narratively there's not a whole lot of stuff you can do with the Tyranids. There's not going to be any books about what one hive tyrant thinks compared to another, no more than any one cell in your body has differing thoughts compared to another. But you know what? As much as it does mean that narratively they're weaker than most others in terms of complexity and depth, at the end of the day, Warhammer is also a war game. That's something I think a lot of people, especially myself and other content creators, could use a reminder of every now and then. All this cool Cool lore exists because GW wants to sell you plastic minis to play pretend general with, and with that in mind, the Tyrants excel at that beyond any other. There is no grand motivation or end goal or any hopeful end to the war, they are here in the galaxy solely to eat you and move on to the next one. There is no inner narrative for them because they are the damn narrative, that of the universe of 40k sucking and everything being the absolute worst to the point that armies are coming from outside the galaxy for no other reason than to make things shitty for everyone inside of it. They exist for no other reason than to cause conflict, so if you want to just get to the point and quit faffing about with silly things like reasons to fight and just get to the fighting, the Tyranids are for you. Ironically enough for having said all that, however, they have the single clearest end goal in all of the setting. Eat everyone. Sure, most other factions have pretty clear goals, that is to say everyone wants everyone else dealt with and gone, but they have all sorts of qualifiers and issues stemming from that. What happens when the Imperium has no more enemies to fight? If it killed off all the other threats in the real world and managed to deal with chaos once and for all? It would probably just explode because it's a relentless shithole of a government. What about the Tau? Having everyone embrace the greater good would make the Ethereals jump for joy until they have it, then they realize they have a caste system designed specifically around their own race that everyone else in the galaxy probably wouldn't be fans of. None of this applies to the Tyranids, because they have a very simple and thorough two-step plan. Step one is to eat everyone, step two is move on to another galaxy to eat everyone in. There are no muddying factors to be had here. At the very most, they have to work around things like Chaos and the Necrons, which is a lot easier than you might think. High Fleet Behemoth was recorded as having just ignored Solemnus, Trazen's museum world, and Chaos itself avoids the Tyranids as much as they avoid it. There is no ambiguity or thinking about what course of action is best, so if you want an army that is always sure of itself, pick them. If you like outside context problems, they're also the army for you. The Tyranids excel at this in all sorts of ways. The Shadow and the Wart means that news of Tyranids beyond there in that general direction is incredibly hard to get, making them surprisingly stealthy on the strategic level. They came from outside the galaxy and have no connections to anyone in it, so naturally no one truly has an idea of just how to handle the problem beyond shooting at it. And they have a habit of making themselves a problem in the most unlikely places, because they've been recorded as approaching the galaxy from under it as well as from the sides of it, which also incidentally means that the Tyranids have a threat range far beyond the rest of the factions in the game. You can be nestled in between the most fortified worlds in the galaxy, but that doesn't mean much if the Tyranids come up from under the galactic floorboards, as it were. These lads are also generally agreed as one of the factions most likely to win 40k. The Imperium is a ticking time bomb of instability. Even if it managed to wipe out all threats, I could guarantee it would fall apart under its own weight sooner or later. The Necrons' end goal isn't just one thing because they're so fractioned and prone to infighting. The Tau, to be entirely frank with you, having a snowball's chance in hell of conquering the galaxy as things stand now. And Chaos is both inherently self-destructive and isn't going to end times 40k because it's GW's flagship franchise. But the Tyranids alongside the Orcs are an endless tide of murderous beings that exist to cause war. Well, I mean, they exist to feed, but people generally don't want to be fed on, which leads to war with the Tyranids, so I'd say it still counts. They have the numbers, power, and will to get what they want, and every single war against them is one only with extreme casualties. To be entirely clear, estimates on how to deal with the Tyranids involve increasing the drafts of the Imperial Guard by 500%. This involves giving pretty much every single human in 3 out of 5 of the largest divisions of Imperial space a gun and telling them to go fight. Let me translate that for you. There's no beating the Tyranids. If you're at a stage where you have to arm every single person in your empire to have a chance at beating back a threat, you've lost. Especially because the Tyranids don't just grow from fighting the Imperium. Food is food, doesn't matter if it comes from an orc, an Eldar, or a human. Compounding on this is their adaptability. When you fight a Tyranid, you may win. The hive mind then remembers exactly what happened and how you won, and produces a new bioform to counteract this. This goes on until eventually it makes a bioform you can't deal with, and you die. It's not a foolproof process, of course. The Ultramarines have beaten them, as have Iandin and the Tau, all in major battles against major hive fleets. 
but combined with sheer numbers and power, this means that eventually they're going to break through. In order to truly defeat the Tyranids, you have to wipe the slate completely clean during a battle, because if so much as a single hive ship escapes, the entire thing is going to be logged and accounted for by the hive mind itself. They can adapt perfectly well at a strategic level too. In response to the Great Rift, the hive mind created High Fleet Kronos, which is a supercharged shadow in the warp and specializes in anti-psyker bioforms. The entire galaxy was split in half by the forces of hell, and the hive mind reacted to this in the same way you'd react to finding out the route you usually take to work is closed for construction. Coupled with everything else, the Tyranids are a damn near impossible to beat threat in the long term. At the very least, given their preference for melee combat, they threaten to do something the major factions in 40k are almost completely unable to do. Think in terms outside of charging into sword range and hoping for the best. The Black Templars are truly doomed. And lastly, the Tyranids are an army that is truly scary at all levels. On the grand strategic level, they are a numberless horde of aliens who view the entire galaxy and all the beings within it solely as food. Estimates to take them down, as I said, require arming nearly every single human being in the galaxy, and even the orcs who get stronger as they fight have only done things like stalemating them at Octarius. It's telling that Inquisitor Kripman, who, while being banished and called things like a fool and a radical for his strategies of dealing with the Tyranids, was never once said to be wrong. On the more direct side of things, Gene Seelos and other bioforms like Lictors are absolutely horrifying. They could be anywhere at any time, and the only hint that you have that they're around could be a sudden scratching on the walls and then a flash of claws as your life ends. They tear through the strongest armor the Imperium has like it's nothing, and even on the ground level, they come at you in packs of dozens, if not hundreds. When it comes to the average person, or even some of the better warriors, such as Space Marines and Aspect Warriors, you aren't fighting a battle when you're fighting the Tyranids. You're prey, desperately trying to deal with a predator that is in almost every way you're better. Now I'm going to move on to tabletop positives, but allow me to give you a bit of a brief forewarning. After saying the rules would all be free, GW then proceeded to go nuh uh and monetize things anyway, because goodwill is for people who don't have a monopoly on the market. So with that in mind, if the rules section isn't 100% accurate, I do apologize. I'm using data sheets posted on the Warhammer community page, so at the very least they're somewhat accurate to 10th edition. And here's this handy chart of 10th edition points on Reddit, which I will also be using. But to be entirely frank with you, I do not feel like giving GW money on something this out to be completely free and then decided to undo that promise. So just to be clear, I'm using the information freely available on their websites. If it's behind on balance changes, then I sincerely apologize, but I'm not giving GW money for breaking its promise. If nothing else, you can play 10th edition with these rules, even if they're not completely up to date or all encompassing. Again, I apologize if I get something wrong as a result of this. So with all that being said, if you like horde armies, you are in luck because this is the 40k horde army. See this? This little guy is a termican. You can take him in units of 20, and he has a gun. There's also the Hormagon version, which is largely the same, except it has 10 inches movement and can advance and charge in the same turn. Good luck killing an entire unit of these in one turn. It also helps that 20 Hormagons are 140 points, and 20 Termagants is 120 points. Put simply, you're going to be drowning the enemy in models fast. They've even got a stratagem that can let you engage in a little bit of resurrection shenanigans, representing how the Tyranids are constantly pouring even more enemies on the table for you to deal with. Why one of these models ends with Gant and another with Gaunt, I don't know. Probably the same naming geniuses that gave us the Fulminators over an Age of Sigmar. Why don't you Termagant some bitches? Speaking of fast, a good portion of the Tyranids are very fast. I already talked about the Hormagon speed, but let's look at the Hive Crone. That is 20 inches of movement. And because it's largely a ranged unit, it doesn't even need to fully close in to be effective. Its main weapon is it drooling on you, by the way, so that's some extra salt on the wounds of whoever gets killed by this thing. The slower units in the Tyranid army are balanced out by the fact they're generally either tankier or designed to fire from range rather than go into melee combat. Pyrovores may only have 5 inches of movement, but they're supposed to be lumbering behind the rest of the army providing supporting fire. Old One-Eye may be slightly slower than the average Hormagon, but he's got a 2-up save and 9 wounds. I'm sure between the horde in front of him and that save, he's going to be able to make it there just fine unless the enemy entirely focuses fire on him. Which incidentally brings me to the next positive about the Tyranids, the strategy of the distraction Carnifex. The Tyranids have many big monsters capable of hitting very hard, which of course is a strength on its own. The Swarm Lord, Old One-Eye, Hive Tyrants, and of course, Carnifexes. Nothing I really feel like making a big old paragraph explaining how this is good, of course. I mean, big monster hit big isn't exactly groundbreaking news. But the strategy of distraction Carnifexes is very simple. In older editions of Warhammer, Carnifexes were very powerful, but relatively cheap for what you got out of it. 
they're also big and scary models. The idea is that you send this bad boy right down the middle of the board into the main enemy line. The opponent will naturally focus fire on this massive titanic monstrosity bearing down on the center line, and in the meantime, 5 billion Hormagaunts have suddenly found their way around the enemy's flank. This strategy is helped by the fact that many of the Tyranids' big scary units aren't terribly expensive, at least in a vacuum. I mean, the Swarm Lord himself is only 250 points for a melee monster that can reliably tear apart all but the most durable of other factions' own super units. This is crucial because the distraction monster is supposed to ultimately be expendable. It isn't a vital part of the army, it's supposed to soak up fire while the rest of the army advances. While the exact viability of this strategy can vary depending on the composition of your army and the size of the game, if things go right it forces the enemy into a perfect catch-22. Either deal with the distraction and let the real problem go unattended, or focus on the units the Carnifex or other big monster is serving as the distraction for, and suddenly the distraction model becomes the problem. Carnifexes themselves have gone in and out of viability for this purpose, but the Tyranids of a whole have plenty of big scary monsters that can serve as the perfect distraction. Big and violent enough that left unattended could cause all sorts of problems, but not expensive enough that you can't afford to actually use them as just a distraction. Theoretically, any army can do this, but part of this strategy is psychological on the enemy player. Plenty of small models in the game can cause all sorts of damage if unattended, but they may not seem super imposing because we're dealing with miniatures. The whole point is that the model is big and scary on top of being actually effective when push comes to shove, and if you look through the Tyranid range on the web store, you'll notice two things. One, people at the time of recording this video apparently can't get enough Tyranids. I mean, Jesus Christ, there's like five items you can actually buy. And two, half of these models count as big and scary. Their adaptability also makes an appearance on the tabletop in a couple of ways. One is the adaptive biology enhancement. Depending on your army's detachment, you can give the Tyranids an increase in their feel-no-pain save if they take any wounds. And of course, there's the hyper-adaptions detachment rule. At the start of the first battle round, pick an adaption for the Tyranids to either focus on hunting infantry, vehicles, or characters. That specification that you do this at the start of the first battle round is huge, because it allows you to take into account not only the composition of the enemy army, but the deployments of them as well. Let's say, hypothetically, your opponent is running the guard. Sure, if they're using a mostly infantry army, you'll want to take the anti-infantry one, but if they're running vehicles with a screen of infantry, it may still be worth taking the anti-infantry adaption to crunch through the guardsmen all that more quickly and get to those now undefended vehicles. It gives the Tyranids an edge of unpredictability. Even if you know exactly what your opponent is bringing to the table and his battle plan down to the letter, you won't know what the army is truly capable of until shots are already going off. They've also got a decent bunch of range units to go along with the melee ones, further making them a versatile army even at the planning stages of things. Now, at least to me, I think they excel far more at melee than ranged combat, but Tyranid warriors can be given quite the area of ranged attacks, a Turvagon is pretty solid in shooting and melee, and while Termagants may not have the best shooting attacks in the game, you can take them in units of 20. They're bound to kill something, especially against armies with weaker saves like the Guard or Eldar. If nothing else, even if you build your army almost purely around being kick-ass in melee, a couple of ranged units to soften the enemy up would never go amiss amongst the Tyranids. They've also some pretty solid Psyker powers, at least in my estimation. As always, I am heavily biased in the Elder way of doing such things, but at the very least, I didn't see any powers they had where I went, why the hell would you ever use that? So that's something they got. I know it's not exactly a glowing review of it, but what do you expect? For me to drop my elven bias for even a single second? This is Warhammer, buddy, not the Elder Scrolls. These elves have my full support. For a couple of miscellaneous positives, Shadow and the Warp is a once-per-battle ability that forces the entire enemy army to take a Battleshock test. While obviously stronger or weaker depending on the army you're facing, what's great about it is that you can do it in either your command phase or the enemy's. So if they have a plan based around using stratagems, you can decide that the entire army is actually moments away from liberating their bowels and forgetting how to follow orders at the worst possible time. Synapse creatures are the bread and butter of any Tyranid army, and they provide a whole swath of benefits. All Tyranid units within range of a Synapse creature take Battleshock tests with 3d6 instead of 2, helping them greatly with morale. And a good portion of the Tyranids with a Synapse ability can use them to either gain command points, such as the Swarm Lord, or give out free command abilities, such as with the Hive Tyrants. There's a downside of that I'm sure you can see, but we'll get to that later. And lastly, their models are pretty much all pretty beautiful looking now. GW did a pretty comprehensive list of updates of them since the video I made complaining about how a lot of them look like shit, and I'm happy to say that most of the main complaints I had have been fixed. Clearly, it was all me who made the large corporation that historically doesn't give a damn about content creators make these changes. You're welcome, everyone. The Gene Stealers in particular look much better than they did, and while it's a shame the circumcised snake that is the Red Terror is no longer available for purchase, at the very least I don't have to look at it on the web store anymore. 
I found it so ugly that I'm willing to count its removal as a positive. Old 1i is still kind of disappointing, and the Termahormagants gaunts are still pretty lackluster for what will likely make up a majority of your army, but for the most part, I'm willing to concede that Tyranid range now looks like it should. Especially the Norn Assimilator slash Norn Emissary. Holy hell, this thing is sexy. Feel free to figure out whether I just mean as a model or sexually. But lo and behold, the Tyranids still have downsides. Some of them with how GW portrays them, some of them as a natural byproduct of the faction as designed. First off, their narrative potential. Like I said, I won't be making a big deal out of them not having characters. If you're going for them as an army, that probably doesn't bother you. But their nature as an endless swarm of hungry monsters lacking individuality means that they are the perfect choice to be used as faceless cannon fodder to die before the real threat comes to the forefront of a given story. This has been used across countless stories and makes the Tyranids look like real pushovers sometimes. It even happened in Caiaphas Cain. In one of the stories, an entire high fleet invasion of a planet is used as the backdrop for some nonsense a rogue inquisitor was doing. The climax of the book was dealing with the guy before the author went, ah shit, I should probably discuss those Tyrans in the background, huh? The ending of the book and the entire invasion was like five pages long and at least to me read like, and then all the Tyranids and secondary characters died. The end. If you've played Deathwing on higher difficulties, you know damn well that these monsters can be horrifying as they skulk through corridors before you turn a corner and a miniature Cthulhu who's still as big as a bus awaits you. They just aren't always portrayed in that manner. Adding on to that, the Tyranids have for some time been written with the idea of you don't hear about Tyranid victories because no one is to report them, translated as, they are never allowed to win on screen. Now, to GW's credit, 10th edition and the Agram campaign have been doing some fixing up of this attitude. I mean, they beat the Ultramarines, of all people, in a narrative campaign. But that's one battle versus several years of the Tyranids constantly losing on screen because of a narrative mindset that, at best, has been poorly executed. I went more in detail in the video I mentioned earlier, so if you want more on that, go watch that video. But for now, I'll just tell you that don't be surprised if Agram was just a one-off and the Tyranids go back to being unceremoniously wiped out on the regular. As much as it sucks, part of this is an inherent downside of the Tyranids you can't really get rid of. The Eldar, Tau, and especially the Imperium have a bevy of characters who can do implausible things because they're named characters. Call it earned skill or call it plot armor, but either way, we expect them to kick ass. Hive Tyrant number 50,742 doesn't have nearly as much personality, so to some extent it's understandable why they aren't nearly as accomplished and get gunned down to make others look cool. The extent GW takes it to is ridiculous, but on some level it's also unavoidable. You are also completely on your own as a faction, unlike everyone else. Now you might argue that everyone's alone, or that Chaos also is unable to deal with anyone, but this is not the case. The Imperium and Tau have gone along before, in fact frequently to deal with the Tyranids themselves. The Eldar and Imperium have allied before, as have the Craftworlds and Drakari, and even Chaos can very tentatively deal with people like the Orcs. At the very least, everyone in the setting can tell the Orcs, that guy over there called you a pussy, and that will reliably get the Orcs going in whatever direction you pointed them at. The Tyranids are completely on their own. And before you mention Gene Stealer cults, may I remind you that those come about as a direct result of the Tyranids bringing them about. It's a lonely galaxy for the hive mind, so you'd best be fast with making it lonelier. Otherwise, the various denizens of the galaxy might realize that their only chance is to band together before you eat everyone in it. Also, I'm just gonna straight up say it. You're playing bad guys. You may say they're not evil and they're just following their nature, which I think is an arguable point, but either way, it's also a moot one. Your stated goal is to eat everyone in the galaxy, but we're moving on to another galaxy to repeat the process. I don't care if it's just in their nature as a hive mind that knows only hunger, that is a negative thing to do and is at best neutral evil. You can argue about whether or not the hive mind is malicious to the end of time, but you can argue that most people would disagree with being eaten alive. And lastly for lore cons is that while perhaps in a realistic sense your faction is one of the most likely ones to win, in a meta sense they're also the least likely one to actually do it. With every single other faction, there's a chance in their win condition for the setting to continue on in one way or another. If the orcs win, they may take a page from AOS and decide to let other factions keep going in some way so they can keep fighting them. The Eldar may just go back to not caring about anyone else if they resurrect their old empire, and the Imperium, even if it won, would probably fracture into like 50 new wargaming factions for you to spend money on. Even if GW puts on their ultra-stupid cap and Chaos wins again, they could always just Age of Sigmar a new 40k into existence. I mean, they've done it before. But the Tyranids? Everyone's dead. They've all been eaten. Even the Chaos Gods fade away because all the people died, which means no more soul food for the warp. There's no chance for the setting to keep going on because the setting has been turned into a barren wasteland with nothing in it. So while we all know that for meta reasons no one will ever win, it hits even harder in the Tyranids' case. As for rule downsides, buckle up because they've got some pretty hefty weaknesses. As befitting a swarm army, many individual units of the Tyranid roster aren't great. Especially the Gaunts and Gants and whatever else. There may be as many Hormagaunts as there are trees in a forest, but individually, they are quite shit. 
If you're facing off against the guard, do try and get them into position quickly, otherwise those basilisks are going to have a field day with you. Similarly, while I mentioned the TRD units being fairly cheap for what they bring to the table, this means the other faction's big hitting units are probably better than yours in one way or another. The Avatar of Cain, for example, is nearly 100 points more than the Swarm Lord, but between his own impressive stat block and the fact that he actually has a ranged attack, I'm willing to bet he'll come out on top more often than not. At the very least, he's able to do more in direct combat between him being able to switch between quantity or quality of attacks and his range attack being able to hit multiple units if you position them right. Please don't take this to mean that the Tyranids aren't able to keep up at all with other factions' heavy hitters. They absolutely are, and in the above instance, the Swarmler does more for his army than the Avatar of Cain does for the Eldar. It's just that in many cases, such as the Primarchs, the Tyranid super units aren't going to 100% of the time take down other armies' super units. Or at the very least, those units can outperform their Tyranid equivalent at some level. You're playing a hive mind where every single unit is a single cell of a larger body working in tandem, and you should bring that mindset to the table when you're playing. The Tyranids took down an Avatar of Cain by having a dozen Carnifexes bullrush it when it called out to them for a duel. Those are the kinds of tactics that you should be using with them, not honorable duels. Speaking of though, that very strength is also arguably the Tyranids' greatest weakness. Their Synapse creatures can provide a whole bevy of buffs, and indeed some of their stratagems require a Synapse creature within a certain range of them to work at all. How it works is that if a unit has the Synapse keyword, they provide the benefits of both the Battleshock tests and none of the other buffs they may have. Naturally, this means your opponent is going to focus fire on those guys to weaken your army. You can negate this, of course, be it just putting Gaunts in front of them or using them in a distraction Carnifex ploy if you're feeling extra spicy, but do take care you can actually afford to use them as such. You'll feel real silly when your carefully constructed battle plan comes to a screeching halt because the opponent had a knight in his army and used it to bulrush the Synapse creature that was the only one connecting three different units. And with how the new morale system works in 40k, an 8 plus their leadership is actually pretty shit, so you best believe you need that extra d6 and your standard horde of 20 units. This is compounded on the fact that the range of synapse abilities isn't great. Standard is 6 inches, with some special units bumping it up to 9. You can take Neurogons to increase the range of the Synapse creatures, but if either the Neurogons or the main Synapse creature die, you'll end up with entire units with even less chance of regaining Synapse benefits than normal. They've also a similar weakness to the Eldar, that of being specialized. It's a rather lore-friendly weakness, I must admit. As much as adaptability and evolution is about growing stronger to face threats, it's also about specializing to fit a certain niche. While many Tyranid units have both decent ranged and shooting attacks, just as many others are built specifically for one of those roles and are dogshit at the other. Hormagons have no ranged option, and the Swarmlord's only ranged option is a psychic power. Not a bad one, but that's his only option. Again, this is fitting to the Tyranid mindset and the lore. The cells in your body all have certain roles. The cells in your heart aren't doing the same thing as the cells in your brain, unless you're Padme Amidala dying of a broken heart levels of lovesick. It's not nearly as crippling as with the Eldar, but it is still something to keep in mind. For some last minute things that are quick to cover, but nonetheless important to mention, they're not great at chewing through armor. The tank hunter hyper adaption can help with this, but even then you might struggle as you bask in the sheer amount of attacks they cause that are strength 5 or worse. And fitting for an army whose whole shtick is being ravenously hungry, the Tyranids devour command points like no one's business. You can mitigate this somewhat by doing things like having a hive tyrant in your army, but you're gonna be needing him because you'll spend far more than you save. Speaking of spending, money. Point wise, the Tyranids are pretty cheap. Real world money wise, well they're a horde army. 50 bucks for a unit of 10 Hormagons is already pricey on its own, but when you factor in that's only gonna get you 70 points worth of your army, I will pray for the sanctity of your wallet because the hive mind will show no mercy towards it. And of course, that also means a large amount of time spent assembling and painting the damn things, as well as the inconvenience you'll have transporting all of them. They are, shall we say, a rather cumbersome army to move around to places. I guess it could be worse. You could be the Lumineth. But when you've said it could be worse as a descriptor for something, it's hard to describe it as anything but a con. Ah well. And that's the Tyranids, an unending swarm of horribly, horrendously hungry bugs that frankly, I find the idea of offensive. I know I've made that reference on the channel before, but come on, did you really expect me to make the Tyranids main video without mentioning Starship Troopers? You're lucky I didn't get the opinion of my friend from Buenos Aires on the Nids. Thank you, of course, to my wonderful channel members. You are the Agri world to my Tyranid Hive Fleet, feeding me for many moons to come until I move on to the next one. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. I have held it in until the end of the video. 
Do you understand how hard it was for a hack like myself to avoid making vor jokes for an entire video on the Tyranids? It has been trying to crawl out of me like a chestburster. I have been restraining myself for all of your sakes, goddammit. I've done you all a favor, you hear me? Anyways, one time I had a dream that Sam Hyde was a fighter pilot in the Ace Combat universe, and people were analyzing his missions like sports commentators. It was weird. If you couldn't tell, I also couldn't think of a good end video joke here. Something something VTubers, something something else.